thing to him. I want us to look at some things, really life and death things, but very simple pictures from Scripture. And when I say life and death, I don't mean that, I want, I want to talk about just the end times, you know, uh, ultimate everlasting life or an everlasting death, but things that have to do with real life right now. So for this afternoon, life. Or things that have to do with what the scripture describes as kind of a, a, a death. I, I won't call it life, but just an existence where the emptiness and, and the ruin of sin, no matter how we mask it, just continues to spread. Now, these are things that I think would help answer questions that might be in your heart. If you don't normally attend church, if you're here because you care about someone that was baptized, uh, I think that there ought to be legitimate questions in your heart when you show up at a church. I mean, I would have them. And one of the questions I would have would be this. Is this stuff real? And are the things that Anthony said about conversion, about God bringing us to himself through his son, are those things real or are they only good for Sunday morning talk? Because, uh, you know, I really would feel it'd be a waste of time for us to spend uh, an hour looking at things that are only good for this hour. So are these things real? And they are. And I want us to talk about some things this morning that make them real. Now, what we're going to look at is some very simple pictures that describe both our need, our distress, and God's response in the rescue that we've been talking about. But also, we're going to look at how these things, when we look at these pictures, how they shape the way a Christian thinks and desires and lives. Now, these are going to be simple pictures. Uh, I really like simplicity in Christianity. I don't always do so well at being simple and clear, but I love it when someone else is simple and clear. Um, you know, when, if you ever go to a new town, one of my favorite things to do is to find, in that city is to find an antiquarian bookshop. So I go to the antiquarian bookshop. Now, I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, all right? Um, like in the church where I pastor now, you know, we do have kind of an ongoing joke that when I go to the nearest city, I like to go to TJ Maxx to look at the new teacups and the men in the church just shake their head because, you know, they go to Home Depot, I go to the teacup aisle. Well, you may not like looking up old books, but I go for the old books. Now, so I go to the religion section, but then I start my search by this. I want to see the old leather editions that are little. You ever see those old books I mean, they're about the size of a deck of cards. You could stick it in your, in your shirt pocket. I think that those are fascinating. You know, books written for your life on the go. You can take them anywhere. What we're going to look at this morning are pictures that God has given us throughout Scripture. We'll, we'll use verse 1 as kind of our hub. But we're going to look at a number of things that God says throughout Scripture that I think of these as very, you know, the combination of these is a small book for us. Theology on the go. Or you could say it this way, every truth that God gives the believer is a truth that you are meant to understand and live upon and delight in and risk everything upon on a battlefield. So you've got to be able to have pint-sized theology that can carry with you, and even when you are under attack, these things are still able to be held before your eyes. So I hope that after this morning, we will be able to walk away with a number of things that are helpful. Now, for that, we're going to get help from King David, and that brings us to Psalm 4. Now, let me give you kind of the outline of Psalm 4. Anthony's already read it, so I won't read it again. Verse 1 is the opening plea of King David. David pleads with God for help, and when you read that, it, it's very Bible-ish sounding, isn't it? I mean, it just sounds like the Psalms. Verse 2 through verse 5 David turns and quits speaking to God and instead speaks to those who mock his hope in God, who are his enemies. Verse 6 through verse 8, David then contrasts his own deep happiness, his satisfaction in God, and compares that with the, the emptiness of the unbeliever, even in his or her best moments. Charles Spurgeon said about this psalm, he said, the psalm was most probably another choice flower from the garden of affliction. 
happy as it is, it is for us that David went through these trials, or probably we should never have heard these sweet sonnets of faith. I remember, it reminds me of another thing Spurgeon said, since feelings, you know, moods, frame, sings occasionally in the Christian life, faith sings always. There are things that David says about God that ought to lay hold of us, and, and we're going to look at what verse 1 says, and we're going to spend really some time in verse 1 and then use that. In verse 1, David is speaking to God, and so let's get two things down right now that David feels are essential in pleading with God. And the first is that God is, he describes him as the God of my righteousness, And that really is critical. If anyone is going to talk to a living God, and it's going to be anything more than show, and you know, you kind of talking to the rafters. If you're going to appear before a God that sees you through and through, and is infinitely pure, then you're gonna have to start where King David started. And we're all aware that King David was not infinitely pure. How can a man like David have access to God? How can any human have access to a God, to the God? And so he starts there, God of my righteousness, the author and sustainer and perfecter of my right standing with him. Second, David reminds himself of God's past kindnesses. Verse one continues, you have relieved me in my distress. It's more than just throwing out a few theological phrases to God. Well, God, we come, you know, prayer number seven, we come to you today, Lord, we, we thank you for Jesus, and you just kind of rattle off the theology. Prayer's much more than that. If we're going to approach God with any confidence, we have theology, that's important, but we also have uh, the ability to look back on the past kindnesses of the Lord, and they really make us bold to ask for more. God, having been so kind to me in the past, when I never deserved it, will you continue to be kind? And so David says, God, you have relieved me in my distress. We're gonna look at the second of those statements. You have relieved me in my distress. In a time of distress, the Hebrew words here, not, the the original language isn't always particularly helpful. We have very good English translations, but I like the Hebrew language even more than the Greek of the New Testament because the Hebrews were very concrete thinkers, all right? So they're not the big brains of the universe, you know. They're not the philosophical thinkers. They're down to earth. And so oftentimes the Hebrew words are very picturesque. So literally in the Hebrew, you enlarged or made room for me in a tight place. So when David talks about a time of distress, don't let that just roll off of you. Think of the kind of troubles in life that when they start to come to you, they really shake you. But you think in your mind, wait, wait, wait. I know how I'll handle it. And so there's a plan. Immediately you come up with a plan. But as you try to work some way out of this problem, things, instead of getting better, get worse. And we could think of a person kind of pushing forward and things are just closing in. But he keeps pushing, thinking that he'll plan B will work, plan C will work. And in the end, a person is so in, in such a tight place, there's this unbearable trouble and hopelessness. And at a time like that, David says, God has relieved me or he has made room for me. God has come to me and brought me out of this tight place, rescued me, made room for me. Now that's the picture I want us to look at. Us in distress because of sin, God making room for us, In every way that sin has brought humanity into a tight place, God has sent his son to make room for us. So we're gonna look at a number of biblical metaphors that kind of fill that out for us. And as I said, I hope they're simple enough that we can carry them with us. As we look at them, again, we're looking at them to see an honest description of what sin does for us because sin is a master advertiser, you know, Temptation comes to us in high definition and colors ablaze. And if we're not very careful, we believe the lies. So it's gonna show us what sin really does, what living for me, we could, you know, we, could, we talk about sin. Let's say it this way. The life that is characterized by this, me, me, what's in this for me? 
That works well in church. Works well at home. Works at work, you know. You can come here this morning and it can be just that. Me, me, God, what's in all this religion for me? And it's sin. But we're also gonna be looking at pictures that help us understand how does the Christian, whether you're a new Christian and you've just been baptized or whether you've walked with the Lord longer than some of these young people have been alive, how do those realities fashion you? Because for the Christian, you know, it's not really that we wake up every morning and we go through a long list of do's and don'ts. It's that we wake up every morning and the realities of Christ fashion how I want to live. Well, let's look at, uh, I have five pictures for you, how God has made room for us. All right, and the first has to do with the issue of God's wrath, justice, his perfect fairness, his moral goodness, and how having a good God in some ways is the worst news for people like us. Paul says that in Christ, there is now no condemnation, and there never can be. And no one can ever again bring an accusation against a believer, and it will stick because of what Christ has done, because of how he's made room for us. In the Old Testament, Job, looking at himself, complained to God that if I used snow water, you know, the purest of waters, and I used soap, and I tried to scrub my life, he said, even then, I would still be guilty before you. And the word picture he's, he uses there is, he says, my own clothing would abhor me. You find that foreign? You look in the spiritual mirror and you see the things you can think and desire, things that you've done that you would never tell anybody you've ever done, thoughts you've thought that you would, you would just flee this group if the group was told what you could think. Don't you feel like that sometimes? You look in the spiritual mirror and you say, God, the best I can do at cleaning myself up, my clothes would still every morning cry out and say, don't put me on him or her. We are in a place of great distress when it comes to our legal standing before God. Because of the sin of humanity, and it's not just our sin. But let's think about sin. What's so bad about sin? We think, well, sin is a thing that will take you to a place you don't want to go. And I don't just mean hell, but I mean, it, it's like getting on a bus and taking us to places that we don't want to live. Sin ruins a man's marriage. Sin destroys a young person. Sin ruins a church. And you say, well, you don't want sin. It takes you to these terrible destinations. But the greater evil of sin is that it is me against God. You against God. You against the people that are sitting around you, even the people we love. Sin is an affront to God. He takes it personally. It is very different than when we break the law and if we have to go to a, a, a judge. I had to go to a traffic court one time and I was terribly ashamed of how fast I was going. So I stood before the judge and, you know, and uh, he said, John Snyder, blah, 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 blah. I won't tell you. Blah, 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 blah. And he said, guilty. And I said, guilty, guilty, guilty. He said, go pay that lady. I'm like, well, that was not as painful as I thought it was going to be, the month of not sleeping leading up to it. That judge wasn't personally offended. I would have been shocked if that man would have looked up from the book and rage filled him, and he just spewed the, the law at me. I would have thought, why are you so angry, man? I, did I personally offend you? But an earthly judge isn't personally offended when we break the nation's law in the same way that God is personally offended when we live against his law. Every sin, in a sense, is a breaking of God's law. It's a denial of his rights. But the law of God is nothing more than, than morality shining through his, his morality shining through into the way that we live. For people like us, the rules of God are ways that we can understand his purity. And when we live for ourselves and against God, it is a rejection of who he is. Sin is an affront against God. It is the object of God's infinite wrath. And when we choose a life of self-centeredness over a life of God-centeredness, sin has made us the object of God's of anger. God's, it's an offense. Think of it. The person we're offending is infinite. His anger against sin and its pollution has no measurement. 
The righteous anger of God is timeless. He's always been angry with sin and always will be. This, this anger of God against sin is not only clean and pure and infinite and timeless, it's everywhere that I go. God only hates one thing. That means all the infinite perfections of God when we think about his hatred or his, his, his opposition to something. It's not diffused over a whole series of things. It's all channeled into one channel. When we find a person who is a, a person of a one-track mind, you know, they only think about one thing. They only do one thing. They have one passion in life. We're amazed at what, can, what they can accomplish. They don't have a lot of things in life. They don't do anything else well, but they do one thing well, and when they do that well, we're amazed. When God's hatred that cannot be measured is channeled into one channel, have you ever considered what distress humanity is under to be the object of that hatred? One of the pictures that I want to give you is the ark. God has made room for us in a spiritual ark. Now, not the ark of the covenant, but the ark and Noah ark. Do you remember what Genesis said? Anthony took you through Genesis recently. Genesis chapter six, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's God's assessment of humanity. So God commands Moses, Moses, I always do that at home. Noah, he commands Noah to build an ark and a century later he sends judgment. Can you imagine the earliest responses? We have reason to think that they may not have seen rain up to that point. Rain comes, whether it's a shock to them or not. I can't imagine that the first drop of rain, the entire town comes and beats against the ark. Noah and his family, his extended family, and the animals that have been selected are inside the ark. God himself shuts the ark. But I do imagine that in the early days of the rain, they thought, that's, that's interesting. Kind of makes you think about that Noah guy in that boat, you know. And then it continues, and, you know, then realty on mountaintops becomes prime property. And, I mean, I don't mean to make a joke of it, but you can see that people would think, well, it will stop. I'll just go to higher ground. How many plans filled their mind? How long before humanity started to cry out and plead with Noah, can you not find a way to make room for me? Christian, you are a Christian because God has made room for you in an ark in Christ. The object of God's boundless delight without any disappointment on the cross becomes the object of God's infinite hatred. He becomes the legal substitute for his people. Every sin you've done, believer, and the worst sin you've done, and Christ as the sin bearer, while not becoming morally sinful, becomes legally bound as the payment for your sin. And you're brought in. God has made room for us in the ark and in the distress of our guilt and shame, we're rescued. Let me give you a second picture. God has made room for us in a kingdom. Another wonderful picture. The Bible often describes your spiritual life in the, sense, in the picture of a realm. Okay, so uh, Colossians 1, the domain of darkness. Verse 13, Paul says, He, Christ, rescued us from the domain of darkness, from the kingdom of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. God describes our spiritual condition presently in the, in the metaphor of one or the other kingdom. But in Colossians 1, Paul uses a very special word. He says he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Domain is not the kind of word that describes a, national, uh, a nationality, like so not a country. And he doesn't describe this spiritual condition geographically. He's not talking about borders and land. He's talking about the influence of a monarch. In other words, you could say it this way. 
Christ rescued us from the tyrannical influence of darkness and then transferred us to the kingdom, to a realm of his beloved son. In Romans 6, Paul picks up that same idea and describes living for yourself as a life of complete slavery. Think of it. Sin comes, the temptation promises you all the freedom you want. You are free to be what you want to be, when you want to be, to have everything you want as you want it. And we grab that lie like it's the best news ever. And we, we shockingly sacrifice for that. We are wholehearted in our devotion, in our pursuit of what we want. I mean, we plan for it. We work toward it. We sacrifice relationships, energy, time. It doesn't matter as long as I can have the thing I want. And at the end of life, just like at the end of every day, sin proves a liar. And I'm empty again. And it paid me with, with, with emptiness and regret. When Paul writes to the Romans, he asks them this question in Romans 6, verse 21. Therefore, what benefit were you then, before you were a Christian, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which now you are ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. What a sobering question. Let's just be honest. All right, we don't have to say the right answer because we're in church. What real benefit did you get by living for yourself and against God? And Paul says it. Well, what it gave us was shame and death. Christ makes room for us in his kingdom. Colossians 1, he transfers us from one domain to another. He takes us from the tyrannical rule of sin and he brings us into a kingdom that in Romans 5 he calls a, a, a realm of grace. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not any ruler in the realm of grace, so don't get that in your mind. Don't think, well, the old life I was dominated by sin and sin and the enemy like this terrible ruler, but in the new realm of grace, I'm free to do anything I want. Actually, that wouldn't be a very happy place. I mean, we don't make good kings. We're brought into a realm where there is a king with absolute authority. So it's not authority versus no authority. Both realms have authority. One authority, the realm of darkness, is a false authority. It's a usurper. It's malevolent. But in the realm of grace, it is the rule that comes crashing into the life of the believer from the love of God. And so now every one of God's commands, instead of standing over us crying out for our condemnation, they come from the love of Christ, satisfied with his obedience, and they become our friends to walk alongside of us. As a believer, I am ruled by the friendship of the king forever. He made room for us. He transferred us. Samuel Rutherford, my favorite author, said, as he wrote from prison a letter to one of his previous church members, he talked about being under the rule of Christ, and he says, Christ's captives have a prince's life of it. He made room for you in his kingdom. Third, he made room for you in his family. It's not just that being a Christian is being forgiven because of what someone else did on my behalf. It's not just that I'm brought out of the tyranny of darkness and into a kingdom of light. It's that I'm brought all the way in to the family. You know Andrew Davis? Some of you know Andrew Davis, the preacher. You've had him preach for you before. We've had him preach for us. My favorite illustration of what it is to come to God through Christ, as he said, the judge declares you, he sees your guilt, he declares you right because of what his son has done for you, and then the son takes you out of the courtroom into the family room of the judge. Sin has brought you into a family that you don't want to be in. We all belong to the family of Adam. Adam fell as our representative before God back in the book of Genesis. And Adam's sin and its pollution, its influence and its guilt was passed on to all that he represented. Everyone under Adam belongs to the wrong family. You try to come to God from Adam's family and you don't get past the gates. You might say, well, look, I want to plead with him. I've, I want to bargain with him. He won't listen to you. What's your name? Child of Adam. Wrong family. 
Everyone in Adam's family has been born a traitor against God and a rebel. Adam's not just my representative. He's my example. And I have followed. Our family trait is treason. And we can only expect from Adam a bitter inheritance. Not only that, but the Bible also describes the effects of sin as, as if we had no family at all, no, no proper family. We might say, well, legally I belong to Adam, but you know, day to day I feel like nobody claims me. Homeless, spiritually orphaned, we are alone, unloved, uncared for. But Christ makes room for us in his family. Romans 8 talks about God guaranteeing the son that he will be the firstborn among many brethren, that there will be all these brothers and sisters, and the common characteristic is that they will morally look like him. Ephesians 1, think about it in, in, in eternity past. He predestined us to adoption, Paul writes, as sons through Christ Jesus to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. But that's not enough. It's not enough for God in eternity past to say that I want this man to be my son and this woman to be my daughter. Galatians 4, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Here's another Adam, Paul calls him in Romans 5. Here's another representative. And if you're united to him, you're in the family. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father. We have the same father as our Lord Jesus Christ as Christians. For which reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. When we say we're Christians, you understand that you're saying that God has made room for me. In my distress, I belonged to the wrong family, and I had no one who cared for my soul. And now, Christ has made room for me in his family. Let me give you a fourth picture. A banquet hall. Here's another metaphor. Sin has promised to satisfy you so deeply you can have, you know, metaphorically, what you want to eat. You can have all you want to eat, you can have whatever you want to eat, and you can have it when you want to eat it, and you can have it for free. And you fill your life only to be hungrier at the end. If you don't believe me and you think, well, you say those things because you're a preacher and you're paid to say those things and you guys go to school and you learn to say those things, but it's just not real. I'm not a Christian and I'm pretty happy. Let me ask you, if you would just think in your mind of the person in your life that you would say, that is the most selfish human I've ever met. All right, I hope they're not in the room. One time in the midst of a early spat, in our marriage, Misty turned to me, my wife turned to me, she's on the back row, and she said, you're the most selfish human on the earth. And we were arguing about how selfish I was and you know, the fact that she was stuck with me now. I mean, this was like three weeks into the marriage and we had one Coca-Cola in the fridge. This was like a bottle. I'm like, selfish? Me selfish? And I popped the Coke and drink it and put it down and she goes, oh, see? So actually I was pretty selfish. Think of truly the person that you know that you could say of all humans on the planet, this person does what they want and they don't care who it hurts. They get what they want no matter what. Are they the happiest person you know? Sin mocks us as it feeds us more emptiness, promises us tomorrow if you will go further and stay longer in rebellion against God, you'll get what you want tomorrow. Why do we believe an enemy that lies to us every day and has never told us the truth once above a God that's told us the truth? It's astonishing. We're starving people. But Christ brings the starving man in and makes room for us at the table there's a, a metaf uh, there's a parable of this in the new testament matthew 22 a rich man his uh 
His kid's getting married, so he's throwing a big party, and he sends out his servants to, the, to all the you know, people who are significant in town. You know, we can put it in modern language. A wealthy CEO, his son's getting married, so he sends out an invitation to all the other major men, major businessmen in a large city, and they all write back quite rudely and say, you know, we're glad, we'll send a little gift, but we're just too busy. So the man's offended, and he says to his, his servants, his employees, okay, forget them. You go down to the street, you get me beggars and normal people off of the street, and you bring the normal people in and let them eat the $1,000-a-plate meals. And they go and they bring them in. Have you ever seen beggars in the city? Does it bother you? You come out, you know, you're going to a big city. I remember being in Chicago. And so we were on this stretch that had all the nice shops, you know. I mean, we don't have those where I live. We have 8,000 people in the city I live in. So we're in Chicago, we're in this fancy place, and you just, you don't even have enough money to shop there, and you just hope that they don't kick you out. But you walk in and you look at the pretty things and walk out, and there's a person with a sign asking you, do you could you give them some food or money? But that's not the picture of you. The picture of you and me outside of Christ is not that we're begging and we're getting just enough to get through the day. It's that we've reached a place where we're a beggar who's too weak to beg anymore and we're starving and we're just really waiting for the end. And Christ comes and finds you and brings you in and washes you and clothes you and makes room for you at the table that should have been a table for the CEOs. Let me give you a fifth. Christ makes room for us in the shelter or in a refuge. And in a, there are so many ways we could apply this. We'd be here all day, but just in a general way, you don't have to live very long on planet Earth to find out that life here without God is overrated and that trouble and distress and sorrow seem to constantly be racing toward us. Now, when I was in my teens, I wouldn't have said that. When I was in my 20s, I wouldn't have said that. But I'm now 51, and I, every time I hear my phone ring, do you ever feel this way? If you're old enough to have lived through some things, you, you hear the phone ring, or you see you know, your phone, and you think, what, what's wrong now? Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says this, remember that you were, before Christ, you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Now, there are at least three tragedies there. Sin has made us all a people who are strangers to God, right? Having no hope, but you still have to wake up and live in this world. We can try to find our own refuge I think we all have. You can try to kind of build a fortress of denial. You say, well, it's not going to hit my family. Well, you'll be the first family in the history of humanity that doesn't have those storms. Or you go to, you know, substitutes and fillers. Like, well, I know that life can be difficult, but I, if only I can grab this, this, and this, then I'll be happy and I'll endure the sorrows. Or you can build the fragile shelters that everyone praises but are useless, the shelters of morality. I'll be a good person. Of religion, I'll join a church. They have never protected anyone, but Christ brings us into a refuge. Psalm 144, David talks about it. He says, blessed be the Lord, my rock, my loving kindness, my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge. No promise that the Christian won't find sorrow crashing through the front door, but there is great promise that he himself will be the one who takes you and makes room in his shelter. Now that's five simple pictures. Let me give you two applications. First, if you are holding Christ at arm's length this morning, not that you're a particularly bad person, not that you're even an irreligious person, but if someone really 
put you in a corner and you had to tell the truth, you would honestly say, I don't want Christ here and now in my life. I would like for him to be a bit out there, you know, within earshot so I can cry for help. And I would like him maybe to come close at a later date, not here and now, at a safe distance. You must understand that these five things which you so desperately need, and you need all five of them, you could not be happy if you only had four of the five. I mean, which would you leave behind? But every one of these, which is essential for your real and lasting happiness, every one of them is beyond your ability. You can't make room for yourself in any one of those situations And so if you reject Christ, how are you going to make room for yourself in the ark, in the shelter against God's wrath, when the one hope you have is the one you reject? What will you say to God? God, I have no time for this Jesus of Nazareth. I see nothing about him that is worth getting worked up for, certainly not surrendering my life to. But God, don't worry. Let me see. In my pocket here, I've got a little fuzz. Here's some morality. Nothing good you've done spins in heaven. You're not going to make room for yourself to hide from the wrath of God. You're not going to make room for yourself in a kingdom of love. Do you know that between these two kingdoms, there's never been one man, woman, or young person that's migrated or immigrated? You don't go from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light because you wake up one day in the kingdom of darkness and say, I'm sick and tired of being my own king and living for these lies. I'm going to go live for Christ. Think of a kingdom with a great wall around it, the kingdom of darkness. And uh, one, one commentator, Bible scholar, gave the illustration of a ladder with 10 rungs. Do you think that you'll climb over the wall You know, when the guards aren't looking, you'll throw the ladder up. You'll really, you'll run faster than anybody else has ever run and you'll get over the wall and you'll end up in the kingdom of God's love. And your ladder with 10 rungs is the 10 commandments. You ever tried it? Well, I don't do this, I don't do this. And you start to climb and pretty soon you hit those and you start seeing what they say about you on the inside and not just the outside. And it's like the enemy comes and snatches off the bottom rung and beats you near to death with it. The law of God has never brought someone from a kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Someone else will have to make room for you. You will not be able to adopt the royal family. You know, when I was in college, I traveled with a young man that he, he just was a little unusual, all right? And he said to me, we traveled together and worked for 10 weeks together one summer. And we were, I mean, we were friends, but not close friends. And he said to me one day, he said, I don't know if you know, but I am in line for the throne of England. And I said, really? Because I immediately thought, you're nuts, man. You're not in the line. And so he explained it. And at the end of the explanation, I thought, you're still nuts. You're not in line for the throne. He wasn't. But do you ever act that way spiritually? Do you say, you know what? I think I'm going to adopt God, the king, as my father. It doesn't work that way. You don't get to vertically adopt. You know, kids, you ever tell your parents, I wish I, didn't ha- I, wish I had ad- another dad or mom. You get mad. Well, you can't do that, can you? God would have to make room for you, you and his family, but you cannot make room for yourself. I mean, we just go through them. You cannot get an entrance into the banquet, the parable that Christ told had another part to it. He said there was a man that came into the banquet and he wasn't dressed rightly. You know, he he really stuck out. He was wearing his nasty clothes and this was a nice banquet. And the man that threw the feast walked around, you can imagine, just saying hello to people. So glad you came. You look really nice. And then there's this man and he says, don't you have appropriate clothing for this? And the man said, well, uh, no. And the man was taken and thrown out into utter darkness. And it's a picture of hell. You think you can come into the banquet without Christ's clothing? You're going to make room for yourself in the shelter of Christ when you reject him? Do you see what I'm saying? Look, you would do your soul so much good if you just admitted right now, you need all five of those and you can't get any of those. But there is one who still commands that you would come 
and lay everything before him and say to him, take all that I know of me and I want to grab hold of all that I know of you and make room for me in my distress. Last application for the Christian. This ought to shape the way we behave. I mean, this ought to shape it much more than just going through and trying to find all the rules of the Bible. Those are very significant. But think about it. I can remember five pictures pretty easily. And before my feet hit the floor tomorrow morning, I want to ask God, help me to live in the reality of these things. How does a Christian live a life? By faith, God says. The just live by faith. We, we walk with the living God by faith. Paul explains what faith looks like in Romans 4. He says, remember Abraham? And he gives two two descriptions of Abraham's faith in activity. First, Abraham believed God even when all he had was God's word for it. Abraham, you'll have a son and a great nation will come from you. And all those years, Abraham has nothing to show for it. It doesn't look like we're getting closer to it happening. Nothing on the outside looked like God knew what he was talking about, but Abraham lived hoping against hope that God wouldn't lie to him. So faith takes God at his word. Faith is not hopefulness, positive thinking. Faith is looking at what God reveals and saying to him, you are my God and you don't lie and I'm gonna risk everything on that and I will live on what you say is real. It gives us the substance of things that we hope for. But also, he said, Abraham's faith did not stumble. And I find that so encouraging. In other words, when Abraham saw the immensity of the promise, he didn't say to God, look, that's really kind of you, but a guy like me doesn't deserve that much. Can I just have a cabin in the corner of glory land? How much easier it would have been for Abraham to believe some promises, but not all those promises. And if you compare what Christ has said to us this morning to what God said to Abraham thousands of years ago, there's no comparison. You look at all the things that God says will be true of the believer now, even in this life. Have you ever been tempted to come to God and say this, look, God, I am really grateful for forgiving me and bringing me into your family, but when I read these things in the New Testament, I don't know, I just stumble. I kind of find it hard to believe. It would be a lot easier for me to believe you if you would just reduce the promises a little. Don't do it. Like Abraham, don't stumble. Go to God and say, all five pictures, we see them throughout Scripture, and Christ has made room for us in every one of those ways. And I am not willing to live a life with the name of Christ written over me that does not include all five of these continually. You continue to make room for me in the ark and in your kingdom and in your family and at the table and in the shelter. It's not a one-time thing. The amazingness of grace just goes on and on. Grace on the heels of grace. Grace like one wave following another, another wave of grace. Grace this morning as if it's the first time that he treated you with grace. And this unexpected friendship from God producing these five realities. And your job is to wake up and to, de- and to delight in them and to live in them. Do not ask God to reduce the immensity of his promises through Christ so that it will be easier for you to believe that God could mean that for you. You just can't measure Christianity by you. Like, why would God say that to me? Okay, well, God would say that to Pastor Anthony, and God would say that to Mrs. So-and-so. She's the sweetest lady in church, but not me. Well, measure it by Christ. Your choices today as you get in the car, how we respond to our family, what we do this afternoon, how you pillow your head tonight, and what your first desires are tomorrow morning ought to be and can be shaped by five simple pictures. In my distress, in all of these ways, you have made room for me. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you not because we're particularly spiritual people, but we are so indescribably needy and you are so willing and able. And where else will we turn 
We don't want to go back to the emptiness. God, we want to press on. So we ask that for the honor of Jesus Christ, so that people that will never read a Bible will see these biblical truths in the simple lives that we live, will you grant us grace to turn to you moment by moment, hour by hour, until we see him face to face and live on these realities. You have made room for us in our distress. Give us grateful hearts, our King. In Christ's name, amen.